make sure you all may be seated. Hey Amen. Let's give it up for worship. They sound great today. Good morning, church. My name is Kurt Flinchball, if you don't know me, and I have the honor and the privilege of being able to preach today. And uh, we're going to be continuing our series, Mission, as we journey through the Gospel of Luke together every week. Uh, but before we do that, I do have a quick uh, announcement. And so uh, this past Sunday, if we can pull up the pictures this past Sunday, Matt Lytle, uh, who's right there with his parents and Kyle, uh, was baptized. And so we do have a photo of the baptism. There he is. Uh, so Matt, you can stand up. And so we get a chance to get to know Matt. He's an incredible brother. And now my favorite thing about this photo is Matt's face after he came out of the water. It's just so much joy. Uh, and then it's funny because then afterwards we turned the jets on and he just sat in it. We're all 30 <laughs> degrees cheering. He's just like, this is nice. Uh, so amen. Spence is in the back struggling with jealousy as he was baptized in a frozen horse trough. But amen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> amen. Uh, the title of today's lesson is Plows, Compost, and Gloves. And multiple people just raise their eyebrows and then Khan is like, yes! Yes! Khan woke up and pulled out his notes as the gardener in the room other than Christina and got very excited. But we're going to talk about plows, compost, and gloves and we're going to be in Luke chapter 8. And uh, before we get started, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I come to you today and I do thank you for your incredible grace and mercy in the way you move in our lives. I thank you for Matt and his faith and just all of us being part of seeing you move in someone's life. And God, that for each one of us, as we see baptisms, as we see people making you Lord, we're reminded of our own journeys and the choices that you've helped us to make and the ways you've moved and called us. God, we do pray for today, uh, as we look at your word, if there's anything I'm about to say that you don't want me to say, remove it from my lips. If there's anything I haven't thought of that you once said, put it on my heart. So each of us may leave here knowing you greater and more equipped and willing to make you known in every home across the valley and abroad. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And while you guys are turning to Luke chapter 8, I do just want to take a moment on behalf of the church and thank every one of you who yesterday took your time and energy to go out in multiple areas across the Lehigh Valley and serve for Martin Luther King Day and to serve our communities. Thank you very much for being willing to do that. I'm sure as the, the weeks come in, we're going to hear stories of how God used our service and helped people, but thank you. Thank you for being willing to spare your time and to serve our communities. Amen? Amen. So Luke chapter 8, uh, we're going to be looking at a parable today, uh, right after the kind of um, jaw-dropping, shocking act of, of, of Jesus having his feet washed uh, by the sinful woman of, of that anointing, and kind of how he uses that to teach about grace. And then as we're going to look, the next kind of chunk of the Gospel of Luke is going to go through a string of parables that Jesus taught. And we're going to start today with one of the most famous parables Jesus spoke. Uh, which means there's absolutely no pressure on me because most of us have heard this before. And as soon as I start reading it, we zone out. And so I'm going to ask you to try not to do that. And I know that we've even talked about this in the past in our own lives as we look at the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils, depending on which perspective you look at. Uh, and, I, and I know we've looked at it from an evangelistic standpoint and, and kind of an understanding of how this parable teaches perspectives of us being evangelistic and sharing our faith in a correct way. But what I want to look at today is I want to look at it from the perspective of the soils and the perspective of what Jesus is saying about the different types of soils and kind of how do we know our response to the gospel. In Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says, After this, Jesus traveled about from town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So we'll pause here for a moment. This, this is something that we can easily just kind of read over in our modern context and, and not really understand the beauty of what this is saying. And, and right on the heels of Jesus having this incredible interaction with a sinful woman, with a woman who, as we talked about last Sunday, would be known in the community for her, her immoral lifestyle. And we see Jesus being willing not only to be associated with her and to connect with her, but forgiving her 
and then lifting her up as a positive example in his parable and using her as, a, as an example to be followed in her repentance and her love and her understanding of grace. He then goes in as he begins to tell this parable and, and the scriptures point out that as he traveled, one of the radical things he did is he didn't just have male disciples following him, he had women. Amen. And, and this was radical for rabbis at the time. In fact, this would have affected Jesus' effectiveness at being re received by the towns he went to. And so for Jesus to be this teacher, this rabbi that would be traveling into a town, for the people in that town to see a rabbi that not only had men following him and learning from him, but that had women that he was allowing to sit at his feet and be taught as equals with the men and, and to be disciples as well and, and to be supported by them... There are many people that would have saw that and immediately not been willing to hear anything Jesus had to say. And so even in this quick little verse, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because it will come up in some later passages more, but just in passing reference to realize Jesus was radically ahead of his time in the equality that he had for men and women. To the point of not just recognizing the equality and their ability to learn from him and to be disciples and to, to be examples of heroic faith, but also in his willingness to not allow that to affect how people viewed him. Yeah. That it didn't matter how people were going to receive him, he was going to do what was right. He was going to do what God viewed and how God treated people, regardless of how the people around him would receive him for that. And he goes on in, in verse 4. It says, While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables. So that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are those who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. And we're going to spend a lot of time in this passage today. And, and obviously, we, we've talked before, I believe we had a midweek towards the, um, the end of last year, where we went through this passage. And, and we did look at the perspective that from us as disciples who are willing to go out and scatter seed, one of the main lessons we learn here is that, that we actually don't know what type of soil someone is until we plant a seed in them. Right? Until the word has a chance to actually take root, we don't know by looking at someone whether they're truly open to the gospel or not. We don't understand where their heart is for God by how they act, how they speak, what choices they're making. It can only be determined by seeing how the word responds in them. And we've also talked before that the only soil we can change is ours. But our job as Christians is not to go into the world around us and force every soil to become good soil. Right. Right? Our job as Christians, as we read the parable of the sower, is what doesn't he do? He doesn't plant a single seed, stand over it, and scream at it to grow. <laughs> right? He's not like, grow! Grow! Like, no! What's he do? He scatters seed and looks for the good soil. And so what is our job as we evangelize, as we share our faith? It's not to force people to become Christians. It's not to force people to become good soil. Our job is just to scatter as much seed as we can, looking for where the good soil is. 
finding the open people. And although we've said before and we'll say many times, we, the, we cannot change someone else's soil, amen? As much as we may want to, we cannot force our, our spouse or our parents or our children to become good soil. Right? Only God can really move in their hearts. Only they can partner with God to change their soil. But what we're going to look at today is there's a whole other side of this parable that we may never be able to change someone else's soil, but we can change the soil that we are. And we're going to look at that today, that, that we can't change someone else's soil. We, we can see where the good soil is by planting the seeds, by sharing our faith, but we can actually change what types of soil our lives are, how the Word produces something within us. And so we're going to walk through these four different soils today. And again, we're going to look at plows, compost, and gloves. And by the end of the sermon, if I do my job well, you will understand what those three things have to do with this passage. Amen? So let's jump back to the beginning of his explanation. And in verse 12, 11 and 12, it says, This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that may, they may not believe and be saved. So it's interesting, as we look at this passage, one of the things we see is that very clearly Jesus is teaching that the word of God is scattered throughout the world. Whether it be by us as disciples scattering the word, or by God moving, right? Even, even now, every one of us in our country, and, and even at the, lar the world at large, has a ridiculous amount of access to the Bible. Through the internet, through everything, but even in modern culture, the way it has permeated, and even we talked over Christmas, the influence that Jesus has had on the world, there are people all over the world who, who may not believe in God at all, but they have at least some understanding of some things that the Word of God says. And it says that God saturates the world and uses people and situations and believers and, and all types of things to get the seed of the Word of God out for what purpose? To produce change. To actually bring forth fruit. The fruit of a changed life, the fruit of a changed community, and the fruit of further spreading the seed, the fruit of further spreading the Word of God to saturate and change the world. And as that Word goes out, as it hits different types of soils, different types of people, different types of minds and hearts, it produces something different based on the, the heart that's receiving it. This first one, it says that it hits soil that has not been plowed. And it hits soil that, that is just on the path, on the hardened ground. And the seed never really has a chance to get into the ground at all. That the moment it hits, it just kind of stays on the, the beaten path. And so what happens? Birds come along and they eat it up. It says these are the people that they hear the word of God and it's immediately taken away. And there are parts of my life where I would actually describe myself as this first soil. Where I would come to church. And I would hear a sermon, or I'd hear the Bible read, or even in my experience, I, I was in a, a, a religious school, and so I'd have a Bible class throughout the year. And, and you'd hear the Bible taught, and I would hear it sitting in the pew, sitting in the seat, and then I would walk out the door, and from the time it got me to get, the time it took me to get from my seat to the vehicle I got to church in, right? I wasn't driving as a child, but, but to that point, it was gone, especially in high school. Like in high school, I'd go to church every Saturday night or Sunday morning. I was at church every weekend. And from the time I left the pew to get to the car, whatever I heard, whatever I listened to, whatever we sang, whatever word was preached, was gone. And the rest of my week looked no different than anyone who didn't go to church that day. There's no ability for the seed to take root. I think as we look around the room, we know that many of us in our own stories have been that soil at one point. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're here today, you are that soil. Maybe you're like, yeah, that's my experience. Church has never done anything for me. I'm only here because someone told me to come, and I'm giving it one last shot. But that's not a final sentence. That what's interesting about each one of these passages is as Jesus is teaching this parable, he's actually using very specific wording that draws upon massive amounts of Old Testament passages. Right? 
when we use our words in modern culture, when we talk, we can, pop, we can reference pop culture in a way that I don't have to say the entire thing, you immediately know what I'm saying, right? And, and so I could sit here and say, you know, we will, we will, Rocky. right? And everyone knows that. Like, I don't even have to sing it. I don't even have to do it in the, the, the sing-songy voice. I just have to say it. And we kind of understand what I'm referencing. And so the Old Testament, in, while Jesus was there, to the Jewish people, the Old Testament was their movies and their radio and their songs. And, and so for someone to say certain words, they kind of knew what they were talking about. They had reference points. Just like I could sit up here and quote movies and, and, and anyone who watches television or movies with your friends, you have certain lines you can quote that you both giggle about halfway through the line knowing the whole scene, right? Like we all have them. Everyone's thinking about them right now, right? And that's kind of how the, the Old Testament was for the people that Jesus is speaking to. So check this out. Go to Hosea. Actually, you can, you can actually stay Luke 8. They're going to come up on the screen because we're going to jump back and forth a few times. So in Hosea chapter 10... Verse 12, it's just one verse. To sow righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until He comes and showers His righteousness on you. Amen. The book of Hosea, or Hosea is written at a time where God's people are not listening to Him at all. And, and the prophet Hosea is called to, to marry a prostitute to win her over to himself. And then after raising a family with her, she leaves him to go back to shrine prostitution. And God shows up and says, hey, guess what? Go win her back. And the prophet's like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, what? And so he goes and he wins her back. And God goes, that's what I do with my people. That's right. That you run after false gods, you run after all these idols, you run after all these other things in your lives, and I constantly run after you to bring you back. And in chapter 10, he's telling the people that have called you back, and now is the time to break up that hard ground. That this, this, the Word of God wants to implant in their hearts, it wants to change their lives, but they have to plow the ground so I can actually begin to take root. And so what's he tell them to do? To plow the ground and seek the Lord. He says you actually got to do the work. Right, a plow in farming is used, and, and, and it can be used on a, a John Deere plow, a mechanical giant plow. It could be used by, by your hands, right? You have individual plows you can use. During the first century, you had horses and, and oxen that were tied together to pull this plow. And basically what a plow is, in the simplest form, and any agricultural people in the room may um, frown upon my oversimplification, but for the point of today, we're going to oversimplify because we have time and most of us want to go to lunch at a reasonable hour. <laughs> and a plow, at its simplest form, is basically metal hooks that you stick into the ground, into like the hard soil. You just like slam it in, and then through some f type of brute force, you just drag it through the hard soil. And what it does is it just breaks up the soil so that that hard top, beaten down, walked on layer gets broken apart and the softer soil beneath can now churn up so that anything you plant in it can actually mix in and take root. It doesn't just bounce off. And so what the Old Testament says in this passage and many others is, is if we are that hard heart, if we are at a place in our lives where we can hear a message and it's never really changed us, we, we, we've never really been able to see our life change after hearing the Bible or, or seeing church, that there is hope. What you can choose to do is do the work of seeking God. Actually begin to try it. My heart started to change, and, and God obviously put me through a, a, a series of situations that kind of started to plow my own heart and, and kind of break up the, the hardened religious shell I had of thinking I was God's gift to humanity. And all of that crumbled, and I realized I'm a sinful person who makes lots of mistakes. And I met someone who challenged me to actually do the work of the Bible. To sit down and not just hear the Bible, to not just listen to it, 
to really fight to put it into practice in my life. To fight to, to hear a passage or to hear what the Bible says, either on my own and reading or with someone helping me, and to leave and try to do it. To try to put it into practice and, and orient my life in a way that actually listen to it. To just give it a chance. And as I gave it a chance, as I, I kind of tested it, I was able to see that this, this thing actually works. That living the way God calls me to actually is affecting my life in a positive way. And so to that first soil that's kind of hard and God says, well, you can actually plow the soil. You can, you can put your hand to it. You can work and try to see what God's Word does if you're willing to actually apply it. If you're willing not just to listen, but to wrestle with how does it apply to my life and my circumstance. Going back to verse 13. The second soil says, Those on the rocky ground... They're ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Mm. So this second soil is, is someone who it doesn't just bounce off. They, they actually hear it and, and they receive it with joy. They're excited. They, they, they want to follow God. They hear the message of grace and it's a great news. Or they see what the Bible calls them to do and the second chances it offers. And, and there's joy in that. But the problem is they never really dig deep roots. And so as soon as trials or hardship or persecution or opposition comes, what happens? They fade away. Right? The strength of a plant or a tree and its ability to withstand the wind or forces pulling it out of the ground are only as strong as how deep its roots are. The more shallow the roots, the easier it is to move. And what he's saying is that the second soil, they, there's an initial response, there's an initial burst of joy, but as soon as it gets hard, they get ripped up. They get thrown away. Right in Psalm chapter 1, we look at two different verses that talk about these roots, because this is a very common metaphor in the Old Testament. In Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. And Psalm 1 tells the opposite. He says, Those of us who meditate on the law of God day and night are like a tree planted by streams of water where its roots are so deep that even in times of drought, it's still able to stand strong. Right? If, if the first soil's answer was plow, the second soil's answer is compost. Right? So if you know anything about compost, uh, if you know anything about Christina and I's dynamic in our relationship, Christina loves gardening. And uh, Christina loves the idea of composting. And composting, again, to oversimplify, is to take food waste, banana peels, organic material, eggshells, coffee grinds, whatever, to basically let them decay. Mm -hmm. to, you cover them, you put them in, basically, again, oversimplification, you put them in a hole in the ground or in a box container, you put dirt on top of it, and you just let it go. And eventually it breaks down and decays and then you mix it in the soil and it adds a massive amount of nutrients to the soil so that the plants you have there can grow deeper, healthier roots and can get more and more nutrients to their soil. And so Christina and I, when we first got married, she, she just got into gardening and, and kind of wanted to start composting because she read about how good it was for your plants and how it would help everything go better. And we lived in this small little one-bedroom apartment in Lansdale. And uh, Christina's first attempt at composting is she took like some type of coffee jar that we had and she put it in like under the sink cabinet. And it was great, but she didn't tell me that she was composting. And I went to go get coffee and I was like, oh, here's some coffee. And I opened it up and I was like, oh, and it just, it smelled so bad. 
And so then, as, as a, as a uh, young, uh, newly married couple, I was like, you can't put it in coffee cans. And, and so we went through a couple weeks where we were trying to figure out where to put it. We didn't think to Google compost containers for the house. Like now we have a really nice one that like looks nice and sits right next to the sink and it doesn't smell and it's easy to use. We didn't think that far ahead, right? We weren't always as smart as we are now. We've only gotten here through multiple mistakes. And so we, the smart idea we had was to put it in a bag and stick it outside of our door next to the step in a hidden spot so it didn't smell up the house. Well, the problem was she would do compost, we put it out there, the next day we come back and the bag would be gone. And we're like, what happened? And so we'd do it again. Put another bag out there with some compost and it would be there for a day or two and then it'd be gone. And so one day we're like, are squirrels taking these bags? Like, they feel heavy and they're big. Like, they're, they're just totally being taken away. And so we did this for about three weeks and finally there was a note on our door from our landlord that was like, please stop putting food waste outside of your door. I keep throwing it away for you. <laughs> we're like, got it. We need to compost differently, right? But, but in our struggles to learn how to compost, there's a beauty that happens because, again, you, you can take the, the leftovers, the waste, and by letting it sit and letting it go deep in the soil, you can actually bring about massive amounts of nutrients and healthy root systems. And, and again, this one here, if you go to Jeremiah 17, how do we become this deep root? How do we become, as Psalm said, that, that tree planted by streams of water with deep roots so that we don't get swayed by the situations in life? Well, in Jeremiah 17, it'll pull up on the screen here. Verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose hurt, heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind toward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. I love this passage, and, and out of all the passages that talk about how to dig deep roots and, and to kind of grow that healthy root system with God, I love this passage because there's a few things that come out of it. One, growing deep roots takes time. Right? Composting takes time. You have to allow everything to kind of break down and grow. And as we see from Psalm 1 and even as we see here in Jeremiah 17, this ability to dig deep roots comes from how much time you're willing to really spend meditating on the Word of God. Not just reading it and moving on, but really savoring it. Taking the time to, to think about it, to meditate on it, to wrestle with it, to chew on it, to spend time wrestling with the passage thinking through what it says and how it applies to you, being deeply rooted in the wisdom there. But Jeremiah 17 doesn't just hint at that ability to meditate on the Word of God. It also then says that, that our hearts are deceitful above all things, right? It, it contrasts this root system with our hearts. And, and the reality is, I think, for most of us, the, the times in our life where we don't dig deep roots is because we just don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. right? So much of our culture and our modern-day culture says that our feelings dictate everything. Right? We, we do something because we felt like it, or we didn't do something because we felt like it, or we have to deal with our feelings first, and then we can act in a way that changes who we are. But the reality of the scriptures and the reality of even ancient wisdom, if you study out Greek wisdom and philosophy, is it's the, the total opposite. That you focus on your identity, who you want to be, and then you take actions that align with that identity, and your feelings flow behind that. What do I mean? You will feel radically different tomorrow if you get two hours of sleep tonight or eight hours of sleep tonight. Can we all agree on that? Oh, yeah. 
So your feelings tomorrow will be dictated by what? What you do. Your actions. And I love that at the end of this passage about roots, it says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? Mm. But the reality is so often we don't take the time to really meditate and wrestle on the Word of God or even then allow that meditation and that wrestling to go into, well, what is our own heart doing? Dwight Moody once said, our thoughts don't fully disentangle themselves until they pass through our lips or our fingertips. <coughs> that our emotions, our feelings, they're just a knot. That we don't really know what they are, but they affect how we act and they move what we do. And until we take the time to pull at that knot and really speak out or journal out what we're thinking and feeling in a raw sense, we never untangle them. And so part of this idea of digging a deep root system means that I have to do the work of spending time meditating on the Word of God and really wrestling through my own feelings in connection to that Word of God. Taking a passage and, and chewing on what does it say and how does it make me feel and, and really how does that balance with what's going on and it's hard, messy work. I was talking to a friend of mine, um, going through a really difficult time with some stuff, and, and we were talking about that, that as men, he, he's a young man, and we are talking about that as men, we will do incredibly brave things without hesitation. Like we were sitting in a restaurant and we were like, if, that, if the restaurant next to us was on fire, he goes, without a doubt, I would go kick the door open and see if anyone was in there. Without any protective gear, without any, like I would just go do it to help him. Right? If we saw a car accident, we'd jump out and help. If he was like, if someone tried to rob this place, I'd jump up and try to help save people. He goes, but you telling me to really do the hard work of figuring out how I feel about something scares the mess out of me. But I want to be someone who's brave. So I'll take the time to think it through and wrestle what's going on. And then to meditate on, okay, what does the word really say? I remember in college, um, we, we started a Bible talk and, and it grew. And, and honestly, our, our small Bible talk that we were doing on our own kind of eclipsed the official campus ministry for the Catholic college I went to. And, and the priest who was in charge of that Catholic uh, small group didn't like the fact that we outgrew them. And so we actually straight up started lying about us and, and, and went to the dean. And, and we got in a situation where all of a sudden I had to go before the dean and kind of defend myself against things he was saying that absolutely were not true. And, and we were bringing people who he was talking about to the dean to be like, no, what he's saying about even how I feel about this isn't true. And, it was a very hard situation, and, and I wrestled a lot with, well, how do I respond? Because in my sinful nature, I'm a fighter, and so like, I knew what I want to do, but that's not what Jesus would want me to do. So how do I respond with this? And I spent like a week of my life, and all I did for my quiet time for like an hour a day, I worked overnight in the hospital at the time, I'd have an hour-long break on the overnight, and instead of taking a nap or resting at two in the morning while I was working, I would take my hour-long break, and I would just go through every I could find in the Bible that was about suffering, persecution, or perseverance, and I would just meditate on it. I, I would sit there and I, I, would, I would go through the different words in the passage and, and I, would, I would say it with a different like influx, right? Like, um, like, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, James, right? Like, I'd be like, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Consider it! pure joy. And I would just sit there and like meditate on it and wrestle with it and then be like does any part of me feel like this is pure joy right now? And I'd be like, well what do I feel? And I, and I would talk it through. But the more I wrestled, the more the root system in trusting God and seeing his perspective dug deeper. And I, and I truly believe the only reason I was able to stay faithful and joyful through that time was because I fought to dig the roots deep. And the final uh, troubling soil here before we look at the conclusion, going back to, to 8.14, Luke 8.14. It says, The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. It says this final one, it, it lasts a long time. It doesn't get taken away right away by Satan. It doesn't have this pop of joy, but as soon as there's hardship, it's gone. It sticks around. 
it could be there for 20, 30 years. But the problem is, as it grows, it grows among thorns, weeds. And what those weeds do is they slowly choke the plant, making it unfruitful. I'm going to be honest, the longer I'm a Christian, this is the one that scares me. Because this is the one I'm in danger of becoming the longer I walk with Jesus. And it says that the the worries of this world, the desire for wealth, these other things that we live in, that we have to deal with. We have to deal with our mortgages and and kids' school schedules. And we have to deal with whether our bosses like us and and whether we're doing well at work and and whether our neighborhood likes us. And, And there are these pressures all around us that we have to interact with. But the problem is if we allow them to grow into thorns, we allow them to grow into weeds, they slowly choke away the life from the Word of God in us. They slowly decrease how much production comes from the Word of God, how much we change, how much our righteousness can be seen, how much we're growing in our faith, how much we're helping other people see God. And over time, we become less and less faithful, less and less righteous, less and less like Jesus. And there's a slow, dying distraction. What weeds do when they grow in the same area of plants is they steal the nutrients. They take away the time, the energy, the resources from what you're actually trying to grow. Christina, I'm I'm very blessed. Christina loves to garden. And I I like having a garden. I like being able to go out and get food. I don't mind building the garden. I don't mind plowing the soil. I don't mind getting fertilizer and mixing it. I don't mind any of that. What I despise (laughs) with every fiber of my home ownership being is weeding. And the main reason I hate it is because it was my chore as a child. And all the time, I, I was told, go weed the garden. And I'd be out there on like my hands and knees, and I'd be digging in and like just covered in dirt. And it was never good enough. There were always more weeds. Exactly. As a child, I felt like there were always more weeds. I'd pull hundreds of weeds. I'd fill bags. And then I'd turn around, and the whole other garden was just filled with weeds. And, and I could never get the roots. And it just, it, I, I hate it. I will do anything else. I almost, almost anything else. I'm very thankful Christina enjoys weeding. She'll go out the garden just to kind of get a break from everything and she's out there singing and weeding and I'm like oh praise Jesus she's not asking me to do that because that would be horrible for me right but in order to weed if I am going to go out and weed I I need to get a pair of gloves because I hate weeding so much that if I'm going to do it I'm putting gloves on so I can get all the way into the roots like if I'm spending the energy pulling this weed out it is never coming back (laughs) and so I will sit there and I will like scratch away until I find the roots and yank that and I'll spend five minutes on one route because I'm like I'm finding this thing because I don't want to do this again and then you get done and you take the gloves off and you throw them away and you're kind of done with that and all the nutrients are able to go to the plant in Jeremiah 4 verse 3 this is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and Jerusalem break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among thorns Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you people of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, or my wrath will flare up and burn like fire because of the evil you've done. Burn with no one can quench it. What's he tell us to do? He says, don't sow among thorns. Instead, what? Circumcise your hearts. That, that metaphor of circumcising your hearts, what it means is to remove something from your heart. To surgically remove part of this. So if we are that third soil, if we have, if we're being choked, if we're becoming less joyful about our faith the longer we're a Christian, if we're becoming less fired up about being able to sit and and be with God and understand Him, if we're becoming less encouraged to, to really want to talk about where we're failing short and how we have to grow, if we become less inspired to want to talk to other people about God or or to really have those conversations be engaged, if those things are being choked out from us, we need to stop and think about what roots, what worries, what idols are taking that attention. And what we need to do is we need to circumcise our hearts from those things. We need to learn how to actually remove them from our lives or surrender them to God. Because there are things in there that we can actively remove. If we're being choked out by all of the bills we have to pay, you can sell one of your cars. 
You can cut back on how many cable TV subscriptions you have so you don't have to work as many hours. You can get rid of internet and go to the library. I know we forget that the, inter the internet exists in the library, but it does, right? Like, there are so many things we can actually get rid of if they're choking us. But there are other things that we can't necessarily actually remove, but we can surrender. Right? As parents, one of the things that so often chokes us is our fear for our own children. As, as people who work in the world, our desire to be liked and to be approved of by our coworkers and bosses, you can't just quit your jobs and be a monk. Right? And not only is that probably not a wise decision, it's also probably not a biblical decision. But either way, like, we can't just do that. And so we have to work, we have to have coworkers, we have to have bosses, we have to have our family, but we can surrender those things to God. And we can be willing to let go of our need to control those things, to let go of our need to change things to fit what we want and trust that God is taking us and the people around us on a journey. That we can surrender the things that distract us so that God can continue to produce the life He wants in us. We're going to close out the final verse in verse 15. It says, But the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. The beautiful thing is, again, we, we can't change anyone else's soil. That's not our job. Amen? It's not my job to go to my neighbor and make them a good soil. It's my job to scatter seed, to show Jesus, to talk about the Bible, and find the places that respond and go help. But what I can do is I can make my life a good soil. I can spend time doing the work of seeking God and, and actually trying to apply it. I, I can spend time meditating on the scriptures and, and delving into my own heart and wrestling with how does God work with the things in my own heart and how do I reconcile that with the scriptures. I can surrender and let go of the things that distract me from God and who He wants me to be. And if I'm willing to do those things, the beauty of it is it's so worth it that you produce a hundred times what was sown in you. The joy that you have is a hundred times greater than what other people see. The, the impact you have is a hundred times greater than what you had. The way that you interact with your community, even the people who don't want to be Christians, their lives are better for having you in it because you show God that everything we do, if we are the good soil, produces a hundred times what it costs us to get. As we close out today, my question for each one of us is which soil are you right now? And whichever soil you are, the question is, so what do you need to do to be the good soil? We will go through phases of our life where, where thorns start to pop up, where, where worries jump in. We can go through phases where we were good soil and then, then we went to the first soil and, and they can change. And the beauty of soil is you can always work it some more to change it. So what do you need to do? Which stage do you need to partner with God to be that good soil in your life? Amen? Amen. Amen brothers and sisters, I love you. Let's have the worship come up for one final song.